to welcome everyone to today's we want to welcome everyone to today's webinar on finding and selecting and adopting open textbooks. And we we do have an expert with us today. Una Daly comes to us from the Open Courseware Consortium, which is a global initiative. Um, Una actually is the executive director of the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, which is, um, I, I guess you'd say, an arm of the Open Courseware Consortium. And um, she presents um, across the country on um, all things open, but today she's going to speak to us about specifically on textbooks. And I know that many of us have in the past maybe dabbled in open textbooks, but the the amount of open textbooks and the quality of them has just um, increased exponentially. So today's um, webinar is right on topic for some of the things we've been talking about and in conjunction with some of our initiatives, which is to have our own repository um, it, within the next 12 months. So hopefully we'll gather a lot of uh, information from Una today to get us started on that. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Una. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rhonda. And uh, yes, I, I'm very pleased to uh, be here today with you again. I think um, a number of you joined us last month for our big picture of open educational resource um, webinar. And um, that one is recorded as well if uh, you'd like to go back um, and review any of that material. Um, the reason I mention that is that today is really a hands-on workshop in the sense that um, we're going to very briefly go over that introductory material about um, what, is, what is an open educational resource, what's an open license. And then I really want to spend the majority of the time visiting a couple of the repositories or listing sites out there that have open textbooks um, so that you can get kind of comfortable going to those sites and um, today and then you can of course do that in the future um, um, at your colleges and, and perhaps within your department uh, because we know how important it is for faculty to look at these together and uh, really essentially um, find peer reviews for those me these materials or perhaps uh, perform a peer review together on materials. Um, as Rhonda mentioned, things have improved a great deal. Uh, the quality of these open textbooks keeps getting um, better and better. And so as we get to those repositories, um, I won't be able to go over all of them, but we'll talk about each repository and listing site has some way of providing a rating system for these open textbooks. All right. Um, if um, you haven't used our system before, um, we do use the Blackboard Collaborate system that you're all logged into. Um, you, I've provided a phone number on that first page. Um, sometimes it's easier to have conversations, so we, the, the phone is very handy for that. Um, if you are on a um, headset, um, you can talk as well uh, with us, but um, you'll need to use the talk button up at the top left hand uh, part of the screen. And you should see a list of participants. You can, in, in the uh, participants window, which is also just under the audio and video portion at the top left, and um, you can type into the chat window, which is just underneath that, and all of the participants will see uh, that text. All right, and if you do have any tech support issues uh, during this webinar, please do use the number below. Uh, those are our folks at the uh, California Community College Chancellor's Office who manage our system, and we're very pleased to, um, to have them available. All right, um, I think uh, Rhonda did a wonderful job of introducing me. Um, I'd love to hear about um, you, you folks as well and what colleges you're at. And I'm going to actually go through the list here. Um, if you're not on the phone, uh, which it, it appears so many of you are not, maybe you would type in the chat window. So uh, David, I'm looking just alphabetically at our participants list. Maybe David, you could share with us um, what college you're at and, and, 
and even um, are you are you faculty there? Are you staff, uh, administration? I don't know if David's on online. I don't hear him speaking, but um, oh, thank you, David. David typed in. He's at Jackson College, and he's an instructional designer. All right, wonderful. Thank you, David. Um, how about Dawn? Dawn, you're 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 next in our alphabetical list. All right, you're at uh, Alpena College. I'm trying to get my chat window to scroll here, and you're in the learning technology department. Well, wonderful. Welcome, Dawn and David. Um, how about Deb? I am with St. Clair County Community College in Michigan, obviously, um, and I'm the academic technologies director. Lovely. Glad you could join us, Deb. All right, we have somebody from Glen Oaks. I think that might be a college rather than somebody's name. Well, while we're waiting for, uh, oh, all right. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Glen Oaks is, is your name. I'm sorry about that, Glen. And you're in a community college in Centerville, Michigan. All right, wonderful. No. Una? This is Rhonda. Glen Oaks is Glen Oaks Community College in Centerville, Michigan. And I believe it's Amy or Patricia that's on the line. If you could just type in the chat who's who's on the line with us and what you do there, that would be great. Thanks, Rhonda. Wonderful. Thank you, Pat, uh, for sharing that. And and Pat is the academic dean and Amy Young. Um, Assistant uh, is online as well, and oh, and we've got faculty as well. Distance learning faculty, Kevin. Wonderful, welcome. Glad you could join us. Uh, Marilee, you're up next. Oh, and she's already typed it in. She's well ahead of me. She's at Musk Muskegon. I'm going to mispronounce it. I apologize. That Muskegon Community Muskegon. College. Muskegon. Muskegon. Thank you. I <laughs> sorry, we West Coast people. It's <laughs> not a problem. Talish, and she's an instructional designer, and she also has Jeffrey with her, who is a faculty. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. Um, how about um, Northern Michigan College? I think that's what NMC is. Northwestern Michigan College. Okay. All right. Oh, and it's Jan. Okay. Wonderful. It's Jan Oliver, um, and she oversees online and classroom technology. And Tina Ulrich, a librarian, may join us. Okay. Wonderful. Good to see you again, Jan. I know you were with us last time. All right. It looks like our next person is Patty, who might <laughs> who might have entered herself a couple of times. No, no worries. If Patty, um, please introduce. Patty is uh, Patty and Cheryl are from the Distance Learning and Bookstore. Oh, wonderful! I'm glad we have somebody from a bookstore because um, I do I do want to talk about the role of bookstores um, in open textbook adoption. And of course, we have Rhonda. I think everybody knows Rhonda. So, um, and how about Schoolcraft? Oh, and Bethel, entire learning department. Okay, <laughs> welcome. All right. So I'm just briefly going to go through my slides about the Community College Consortium. If you weren't at our last um, uh, webinar, we. Um, we are the Community College Consortium at the Open Course, where we're an associate consortium of theirs, but we, we work very closely together. Um, we were actually started out in California um, originally um, by Dr. Martha Cantor, who was our Under Secretary of Education until just a few, just a month ago. Um, and Barbara was a real visionary around um, bringing open education to the community colleges. Um, and she felt that both the uh, cost savings for our students and the creativity for our faculty were really um, wonderful things that could come from community colleges getting engaged in open education. But our focus, even though we're part of this large global organization, the Open Courseware Consortium, which is over 250 institutions worldwide, is our focus is the community college, the two-year college mission. Um, although we, although we often, if you've attended our webinars, we often have 
folks both within and without the system. So, um, because our students, of course, articulate to the four-year colleges and universities. So it's very important that we keep that communication going. And here's a brief picture of um, of our members, and we're very uh, happy to have um, you guys right here in Michigan um, as part of our consortium. So uh, here's our agenda today. We're going to kind of whip through our early part of uh, this uh, true or false and uh, access to education, and we're going to get right into finding open textbooks and then um, uh, the adoption process. So these are kind of fun questions to get people started. Um, and so I'm going to ask you uh, just to use your um, you can either type in the chat window when I when I mention the uh, the question, or you can use your uh, little check boxes up at the top, um, where if you look at directly underneath my name, the moderator, you'll see like a little check box, and you can either say yes or no up there. So open textbooks are free. Is that is that a true or false statement? And let's see. So I'm going to go ahead and click. Okay, great. So we've got all right. Rhonda and Marilee, uh, we have a lot of folks saying no. Okay, Dawn says yes. Um, and as if you've done these quizzes with me before, you know that usually uh, there's no one correct answer. And so open textbooks, uh, will, uh, so I think that um, everybody answered correctly. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail uh, on our next slide, but open textbooks are Free to use online. That's the generally accepted uh, definition. Um, they have an open license, which means they're free to use, reuse online. Uh, are they free to get a printed copy? Uh, depends. Um, most most of the repositories have a print on demand option where they will uh, sell a book for a modest fee. Those are not those are those are not free. You do pay for the printing costs and the shipping costs. So, um, and so that's kind of the superficial answer. But of course, we know that open textbooks must be developed, um, and often that is done through grant programs, um, and that provide money so that faculty and other subject matter experts can work together. Okay. Next time, I'm going to ask one of you to explain that. So um, here, here's another one that we hear about open textbooks and has some validity, possibly. Open textbooks don't have test banks. True or false? Okay, and I'm I'm, I'm getting mostly false. And would anyone um, like to share their their thinking about that one? If you're on the phone, or, or you could type in the chat window. I'm going to assume that this is Rhonda. I'm going to say it depends. I think some of them do, uh, not all of them do. Yes, you're absolutely right, Rhonda. Um, a lot of the early open textbooks didn't have test banks. They're more just content um, without really the assessment or testing component. Uh, but that's changing, and there's a grant. Um, that I'm going to talk about in a minute that's going to help out a lot with that. Um, and certainly there's some areas such as the math area where there's a lot of test banks that exist. So um, that's really changing. Um, and then my final one is open text, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and clear that. And then open textbooks are only available in math and science. I sometimes hear this from folks. Okay, wonderful. And I'm getting pretty much a consistent no. And um, there are a great deal of open textbooks uh, being written for math and science, which is exciting. Um, so that, you know the STEM area is very popular, but we are seeing more and more um, come becoming available in the humanities and the social sciences. So thank you for playing that game with me. And once again, here's the definition of open educational resources from the Department of Education. And once again, the emphasis is these resources, they reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use or repurposing by others. So that's the free piece. Um, but we all know that quality instructional materials take faculty time and expertise. 
And um, a number of us were at the Open Ed Conference about two weeks ago, um, which is which is an annual conference. Um, sometimes in the United States. This year it was in the U.S. in Utah. And uh, they announced um, an open item test bank grant that had been received by um, David Wiley, who is one of the uh, open education leaders in the U.S. And they are developing an open item test bank for the top 20 college courses. And they estimate they'll do about 750 questions per course. So this is going to help a lot with um, the you know the general ed components um, of the open textbooks. Um, in other areas, there there still is is room for growth. Um, here is just an example of a recent textbook that was released this fall. Um, for those of you who uh, attended our advisory meeting in September, which is we have monthly advisory meetings. Um, our community college consortium. We had Dr. Marie Lassiter, who's at the University System of Georgia, talk about this open textbook that they developed, uh, their faculty within the university system developed over the last three years. It's a very high quality, peer reviewed um, U.S. history open textbook that is free to download and use digitally. Um, I think, you know, I actually I don't know what the options are around print, but I know they do have print options for this. And it is, it is a history of the U.S. Um, from colonial times through 1877. And a question I asked her was, um, when, is, when is the next one coming <laughs> from 1877 uh, through the 20th century? She said, we're working on it. So it's really exciting to see these really high quality um, textbooks coming out of um, the system that will be available for um, all of us to use. And you know, once again, the, the big OER um, landscape includes not only open textbooks, it includes, includes open courses. Um, sometimes even um, some MOOCs are open. Um, the, the vast majority are not open right now in the sense of they're not the content is not open. You cannot remove it. But um, there's more and more plans around trying to have um, a MOOC platform that will be open, um, really open in the sense that um, faculty and students can take those materials and repurpose them. Um, and of course, it includes in, uh, videos and images and, and other items. But today, we're going to focus on open textbooks. And so the, the characteristics of an open textbook is that you as an instructor or staff um, um, can modify these. Um, and um, you, may, you may want to introduce uh, case studies that are more relevant to folks who are living in Michigan. So if your, your learners are in Michigan, it's a business case study. You might want to look at the car industry, for instance. In California, we might be looking at case studies around agriculture, maybe the movie industry. So you can, when you take an open textbook, you can modify that open textbook to add in chapters or case studies that are relevant to your students. And you can remove case studies that um, are not applicable to your student population. Um, also, if the materials you choose to use are not accessible initially uh, for students with disabilities because they're openly licensed, um, you could add in video captions, for instance, um, and things like that. So um, very important pieces around providing a high quality experience for students. Um, low cost, of course, is a huge piece of it. Um, they are free online um, and then printable um, either by the student or, or with a low cost hard copy option available. And when we go to the different repositories, I'll talk a little bit about um, those options. So once again, what is this open license? So this open license is we call this Creative Commons. Um, or that is that is the term. It's Creative Commons, and, and I, I do recommend that you go to the CreativeCommons.org site if you haven't been there. And they talk in more detail about how 
they were started over a decade ago um, to really address the needs of um, this digital age and where people are creating all of these materials, but copyright law is very restrictive and gets in the way of sharing. And we as educators really want to be able to share our resources both with each other and with students. <laughs> Um, and so what Creative Commons allows you to do is with materials that you create or that you find out on the Internet, um, you can repurpose those um, and put um, and with a Creative Commons license which allows, if you're the creator, you still maintain your copyright, but it allows other people to reuse it. Um, without um, the restrictions of copyright where they would have to get a formal agreement with you. And I, I'm not going into detail on that one today, but I'll just tell you what, what are the um, pieces of Creative Commons that you need to be aware of. The Creative Commons, once again, sits on top of copyright and allows you to give a version of your materials away. And the minimum that someone has to, to, to uh, perform if they use uh, creatively Commons license materials is they have to um, give attribution to the creator. Now, if the license also contains the non-commercial uh, component, which is this little dollar sign with the cross through it, that means that they may not resell the materials. However, if somebody shares a material and doesn't specify the non-commercial, then it is possible for somebody to um, incorporate that into a business model. And finally, the last um, condition that you should be aware of is the share alike, and that's on the far right side there of the slide. And what that says is if that's part of the license, um, the creator uh, has specified that if you reuse their materials and you're going to publish them, you need to share it the same way that they did. So you need to use the same Creative Commons license along with um, the three conditions if they specified them. So we'll, when we look at some of the textbooks, um, you'll see that some of them have different licenses depending on either the repository policy or um, if it was an individual faculty who produced it, they will have um, specified what the license is. Now, I know that that is confusing and I went over it quickly. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and, and just type those in the chat window and I'll try and answer those or, or speak up. And once again, the website is creativecommons.org and they have a lot of um, great tutorials there to help you understand that. All right, well, we'll move on. All right, I'd um, like to ask now before we uh, jump into the uh, existing repositories if anyone has used or even reviewed an open textbook um, for the possibility of using it in their classroom. Okay, so I, I'm getting um, Dawn and Deb have not. All right. Looks like Patty may, Patty may have tried something. Nope. No. Nope, maybe not. <laughs> oh. Okay. Wonderful. So Patty um, says she, that she reviewed a psychology textbook. Um, and Patty, do you can you tell us um, either the author of that textbook um, or um, where you found it? I'm going to make a guess that Patty may have reviewed the Introduction to Psychology textbook. Okay, no problem, Patty. Uh, there is an excellent Introduction to Psychology textbook available at um, Sailor at Sailor.org, the Sailor Foundation. Um, it actually was a former um, Flat World Knowledge textbook, and I believe the author is Stanger. And it actually has a, um, a CC BY, it has a Creative Commons license with a non-commercial share alike condition on it. All right, so Marilee says that Jeff looked at, oh, that wasn't it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Patty. Uh, and Marilee said that Jeff looked at some materials from MIT, but the content was too high for our students. Okay. Great. And 
Uh, that's a really good point, Marilee. Um, so uh, it sounds like Jeff looked at some of the MIT open courseware materials. Of course, MIT is part of the open courseware consortium. It was one of the founding members. Um, in, in some cases, when you look at those materials from MIT and other four-year colleges and universities, it is possible to modify those materials uh, because it has an open license. And you can change them so that maybe you take the reading level down to where your students are comfortable. Um, sometimes, it, um, sometimes that's more work than, it's, than you want to undertake. Um, but, there, but an open license does provide you with that option. Okay, and Patty says, in our case, the content was more K-12. Okay, all right. So, okay, I see. Hmm, that's interesting. It would be interesting to see what that what that textbook was. And yeah, so I will tell you that there is a lot of uh, four-year college materials available. But over the last two to three years. Uh, the private foundations and even um, the state governments have really been focusing on general education, which means that more and more of the open textbooks are really focused on the first two years of college. Um, so many of them can be taken in a fairly, it really they can be taken as is and used in the classroom. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that. Here's here's an example of um, the cost savings and um, the license difference between using a commercial textbook. Uh, this one on the left is um, Introductory Statistics. It's published by Wiley and Sons. It has a full copyright. You can um, get it um, at Amazon for $142.48. Um, it probably is available at the bookstore of colleges that are using it for a slight markup above that. Um, and a similar textbook which um, has been used for over 15 years um, as an introduction to statistics text has been updated over that period of time as well, is available digitally uh, for no cost to students or faculty. It's available in a soft bound hard copy, if you will, uh, through the connections. Um, repository for $26.20. So huge savings for students. And when you look down here at the publisher, that is Connections, which is the OER repository at Rice University. And the license that it has is a Creative Commons license attribution. So that's the, which, uh, what that license says is if you reuse this textbook, um, and uh, you can reuse it as is with your students, no problem. But if you want to make modifications to it, um, you need to um, specify that you got the original textbook uh, from Connections, and you need to give Barbara Alowski and Susan Dean, who are instructors at De Anza College in California, you need to give them credit as original authors. But that's that's the only restrictions on that one. So a, a very good deal for statistics um, professors and students. So um, now I want to talk to you about the steps for open textbook adoption. Um, and today we're really going to focus on number one and number two. So finding and selecting textbooks. Um, so this is not as easy as it should be. Um, you will find that uh, you ha you generally will be you generally will go to a few repositories when you're getting started. Um, over time, I find that people really gravitate towards one or one or two repositories that they find their materials at. Um, but today we're going to talk about kind of the wide selection of repositories and how each repository has some kind of con quality control measures around those um, textbooks. Um, and then secondly, we'll go into adopt and use. Let's say you found something now that may be appropriate for your classroom and you want to work within your department and your college um, to um, make the transition to this open textbook smooth. Um, and you may also be looking at customizing it. Um, that, that's a potential. And then finally we'll, we'll, we'll go through steps three and four very quickly at the end um, about uh, gathering research and how important that is to this process and um, planning for sustainability. Um, as you go down the open textbook uh, path, 
um, you do need to think about uh, revisions and support into the future. It's not a decision that you make today and um, don't have to continue to manage or, or to think about into the future. Um, and this isn't really different than um, publisher textbooks. Um, one has to um, make sure that uh, as things change within their dis discipline that the um, textbook uh, will reflect that. And with publisher textbooks, uh, they may be doing some of that for you, but you as the subject matter expert need to stay on top of it as well. All right. So there's a lot of different repositories and listing sites out there to help you. Um, how many of you are um, Tell me about how many of you are aware of um, some of these sites. And please just go ahead and type in the chat window um, if you've gone to any of these sites before. All right. Okay. Yes. So Merlot, and I bet that uh, I know we have some librarians on on um, online. And Merlot, of course, is um, one of the oldest repositories out there. Um, and we really call it a referatory because Merlot generally doesn't contain the content, but it refers to either open content. Uh, it's not always open, but, but it, Merlot has a huge listing of open materials as well. And it also allows um, faculty um, and staff who, who are using the Merlot materials to make comments on it. Merlot also maintains a very um, comprehensive peer review system um, which um, it uses to um, obviously to, to review materials within Merlot. Not all materials within Merlot are peer reviewed, um, but many are. And um, you also have the option of, of providing comments. So if you're a regular Merlot user, um, you can provide comments on um, materials that you find in there. You can also enter materials into Merlot yourself, which is kind of exciting because it's a very community-based system. All right, well, thank you. So we've heard uh, that um, folks uh, at Glen Oaks have uh, looked at the University of Minnesota um, collection. So yes, and that's a very high quality uh, but small listing of open textbooks. Um, and at, with peer reviews. Now, not all of the open textbooks have been peer reviewed, but the folks at the University of Minnesota have really been trying to incentivize their faculty um, to do peer reviews. Um, they only, uh, at the University of Minnesota, they, th their policy has been to only use very complete open textbooks in their listing site. So you're going to find very high quality materials, and some of them do have peer reviews um, on site there, which is exciting. All right. Oh, David says that he's used OER Commons and OpenStax. Wonderful. Um, OER Commons is, is a really amazing site as well. Um, it can be a little difficult to use initially, but if you're a person who's very comfortable with search sites, it's an excellent resource. And it also allows a rating by users. So you um, in order to provide ratings at OER Commons, you create a free account where you identify your, who you are and your expertise, and you can do that. Um, and then as you um, comment on materials, uh, people will know what your credentials are, and you will let them know how the materials you worked in your classroom. You can uh, comment on pedagogy and content, and so wonderful site. OpenStax we're going to go to in a minute, so I, I, uh, but thanks for sharing that, David. And let's see, Patty, well, Patty has also been to Orange Grove, um, OER Commons, Connections, Merlot, and OpenStax. All right, wonderful, Patty. So Patty has really been to most of these sites. Um, and I will say Orange Grove Text Plus is a repository uh, that is managed by the State of Florida, by their Florida Virtual Campus. Um, in fact, uh, the manager of that is a member of our consortium, so if you attend our, any of our um, advisory meetings, which are open to community college folks, uh, you might run into Robin. Uh, they do a wonderful job of not only putting textbooks of their own creation there from Florida that are open, they put some open courses in there. Uh, there's open courses for information literacy for students and for Internet browsing. Um, and they also harvest what we call harvest, harvest resources from other repositories because the Orange Grove is Florida's state repository. And um, so they actually 
take things from other open repositories and put them in there so that their Florida staff and faculty, uh, in fact, Orange Grove is a K through 20 um, um, repository, um, can actually um, get the materials directly there. So uh, thank you for that. I'm just going to mention really quickly the ones that didn't come up. Sailor.org is um, a foundation. Um, it's about five or six years old. Um, and it's all about providing free online college education that's openly licensed. Um, they have a book list of open textbooks, which is uh, simply alphabetically listed. I think they have something uh, so over a hundred textbooks, um, and they're very high quality textbooks, and they're available in Word and PDF format. The nice thing about being able to get these textbooks in Word format is that it makes it very easy for you to modify those. Um, and which uh, California State University um, works very closely with Merlot, uh, but their affordable learning solutions site is also a very useful place to go. We're going to talk a little bit about College Open Textbooks, which is a very simple site that's been around for about three or four years. Um, and textbooks are organized by, um, by discipline. And they're simply listings of textbooks by discipline. So it's a great first place to go. And they also provide peer reviews um, at that site um, for 150 of those textbooks. So although the listing site is over 700 at this time, you'll find some great, um, some great reviews as well. So let's get started. So here is the uh, College Open Textbook site. And I'm going to take you over to this. Um, and you should be able to see me typing this in the window. Um, and I'm taking you over to this website. And we're going to go to the open textbook content. And I'm going to ask for um, a question from uh, a volunteer from the audience. Um, what, what discipline would you like us to take a look at? You can see that there are 24 disciplines here, ranging from anthropology and archaeology to, um, to statistics and psychology. So um, anyone who's on the phone or, okay, nursing. Aha, uh -huh, Deb added, asked for nursing. Um, so you know, Deb, I'm going to get back to you later on. In fact, if you if you um, contact me offline, I will help you with some of that nursing stuff. Right now, there is not as much nursing available, but um, there are some sites. Oops, there there. Let's say there aren't as many um, open textbooks available for nursing right now. There are definitely some pre-nursing textbooks available, but there's some good stuff coming. So. Um, Contact me about that one offline. Okay, English. I'm going to go with English since, of course, uh, English composition is part of that gen ed area. All right. So here is a listing of English textbooks um, from the College Open Textbook site. Um, and we can see that there are um, there's college writing. Um, there's an electronic literature collection. Um, now, uh, when Glen Oak said English, they didn't give me specifically um, whether it was writing or or literature. Um, so this this particular one has some composition books. Um, it has the Flat World Knowledge Handbook, um, which is available from Sailor.org. And um, so which a uh, composition? Okay. So that would be um, the writing textbook. And um, this one, this one here, the Flat World Knowledge Handbook. I'm gonna, look, I'm gonna go over here. I think the location that we're gonna find this one is at Sailor. I'm going to let's see. I'm going to I'm going to I, my uh, so I'm going to uh, allow you to um, 
also go to this site and check it out. Um, I'm going to put that into our College Open Textbooks org and go ahead and click on that and I'm going to let you as well take a look at that while I'm sharing my website here and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us to books I'm going to take us to books all right so um, Glenn Oaks asked for the um, English textbook, and um, if we can find um, that in that particular English textbook is inside here, inside this list. Here is Business English for Success, Business Communication, but I'm going to try and find the handbook. Let me see. Here's the handbook for writers. Can everyone see this um, screen? Rhonda, since you're on the phone, can you see the screen I'm showing? Yep. I can see it. Okay. So this is that handbook for writers. It was written by a community college instructor um, for flat world knowledge originally. And so this version is open. Um, and you can see that there's a PDF and a doc um, version here. I can click on this and download. So I'm not going to do that at this time just because of the time it will take, but for the Glen Oaks people, I'm going to go ahead and post this back in our, um, in our window and let you take a look at that um, when you have a chance. And, and you can download that book directly. And I think you'll find that's very useful. It was written for community college, whoops, <laughs> community college um, folks. And oops. Get back to my window here. Oh, I may need to quit my browser here. Just a second. So go ahead and, and search that um, sailor.org books while I'm <laughs> while I'm getting back to my window here. Excuse me for that. Alrighty. There we go back to our whiteboard. Um, so I'm going to move along to our next one. This is the OpenStax College, and I believe it was David who said that um, he had used these. Um, OpenStax has produced five open textbooks so far, focused on Gen Ed, um, and that's physics, sociology, biology, concepts of biology, and anatomy and physiology. So those are all available now for you to use, um, and they are they are located at the Connections repository at Rice University. Um, Connections uses a um, they use a rating system themselves called Lenses, where um, professional organizations, colleges, um, faculty can identify and create a lens. Uh, of endorsed material. And all of these um, textbooks here um, have been peer reviewed and developed by subject matter experts. And I'm going to I'm going to, I'm going to do some sharing here. Let's see, hosting is paused. All right. Let me take you out to OpenStaxCollege.org. And if we click on our books, we will see um, you'll see that the five textbooks that I mentioned, they are currently in the process of creating um, 20 textbooks in total, all focused on Gen Ed. And um, here, if you click on the Our Books link, it'll take you directly to the five that are available today and you can uh, download those. All right. So I'm going to, um, let me see, where is my chat window? Okay. So here, here is that, um, that URL. 
All right, so Glenn Oaks asked me about the peer review. So the peer review at OpenStax College, um, I believe there's three there's three peer reviews, uh, three folks who do the peer reviews. Um, they use basically the publisher model for peer reviews at OpenStax. Um, that isn't always true of all of the repositories. Um, College Open Textbooks, for instance, um, when they pu they publish their peer reviews, they are written by a single uh, faculty or subject matter expert. So it will vary. Okay. Great question, Rhonda. Connections is the OER repository that was started at Rice University um, about, I think it was started in 1999 or 2000. Um, and OpenStax College is a project of Connections, but it has multiple, um, multiple uh, donors who work with them. Um, in addition to um, Connections and Rice University, the Maxwell Foundation, um, I think the Gates Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation is also uh, working with them. And so Connections is an OER repository, and these OpenStax textbooks are textbooks that live within it, but they're a special, um, they're a special project. Um, and I <laughs> hope that helps. <laughs> um, so in general, when you go to Connections, you're going to find different learning modules. Um, but if you want to specifically get to the OpenStax materials, you should go through the OpenStax website and it will actually take you into the Connections repository where they live. Um, alrighty. And um, Merlot, um, we uh, talked about Merlot before um, and I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to put the website address for um, Mer Merlot that um, I would recommend you go to, which is MerlotX.org. Um, and I think I won't do that today, but when you go to that site, what you will see is Find Open Textbooks, and if you click on that, it will take you directly into that, um, that uh, browser window for finding open textbooks at Merlot. Uh, once again, there's many peer reviews at Merlot. Um, and accessibility is one of the really key um, policies and strategies at Merlot. They want to make sure all materials are accessible. So you will find accessibility reviews and they encourage you as community users to share any information that you might have about the accessibility of an open resource. And there is a community um, called the OER Access at Merlot.org if that's an area of interest to you. And I'm going to type that here into um, the chat window. But there's a lot of great material there um, at OER Access.Merlot.org. And um, I encourage you to check it out if, it, um, if, excel if accessibility is um, an area of interest. And finally, I'm going to show you Sailor, Sailor Open Textbooks. Uh, once again, I mentioned that Sailor.org is a was a, a it's an educational foundation that was started based on the idea of providing free education, free college education to anyone in the world. Since that time, um, Sailor has really branched out. They are, they work with the Adult Council on Education um, to have their materials. Um, accredited in the sense that they can be used uh, for students to then take exams at different colleges and get credit for those. Um, they also ha uh, work with um, learning counts around helping students to develop portfolios for prior learning assessment. And in addition to that, they maintain a list of open textbooks um, at uh, the Sailor Open Textbooks site. Um, and I showed that to you earlier, um, but I'll show that to you one more time. For some reason, I can't get out on that. So what I'll, I'll show it to you here in our um, I showed that to you earlier uh, for the writing, for the handbook for writing, but there's over a hundred textbooks here. Um, they're freely available for download uh, and sharing under different open licenses. And um, it's all in alphabetical order based on the title of the um, textbook. So do check those out. Um, 
many of these have been peer reviewed through the publisher model of peer review, which means that they have been peer reviewed by subject matter experts, but the peer review itself may not be available. Um, but I, I do highly recommend this list. There's some really excellent resources here. And you can see it just it, it goes from business to English, um, um, sociology, economics, etc. And um, you know, for instance, if we click on this sustainable business case book, it's going to take me out to the it'll it'll simply download that word file onto my um, computer and then I can edit it um, as, as I want to. Now, once again, these have a Creative Commons license. If you're going to publish these um, materials that you've modified, you do need to um, consider putting an open license back on them. All right. So that was a, that was a, <laughs> a whirlwind tour <laughs> through a, a number of the really popular um, sites. And um, I want to just give you a couple minutes to look at those on your own. Um, I've typed those in there. I'm going to just give you just a couple minutes um, to type these uh, URLs into your browser window. And then um, I'm going to ask you to share in the chat window or if you're on the phone, um, you can let me know uh, what you found. Um, All right, I'm just going to give you about 30 more seconds. Um, but if any of you have um, found um, a resource that you think would be useful to bring into your classroom or, to, or if you work with faculty, a resource that you think might be helpful to share with them um, for possible adoption, um, I'd uh, invite you to share that with us now. All right. While we're waiting for uh, somebody to share, um, why don't uh, you let me know? Uh, okay. Thank you. Well, uh, well, wonderful. Rhonda updated the OER page on the um, uh, Michigan uh, Community College Virtual Learning Consortium. Good to hear that. Um, of these four sites, um, let why don't you tell me which one you, you um, think might be most useful for um, faculty or staff who are new to open textbooks? Um, and how about if I ask you, would it be college open textbooks? Uh, can you answer yes or no to that one by clicking on the little um, check mark at the, at the uh, top? Okay, so I've, I've clicked on yeah, Okay, and Rhonda thinks College Open Text would, would be useful. It has a very simple list 
with just discipline specific um, areas. What about um, so thank you for, uh, and Glenn Oaks felt that college open textbooks might be valuable too. Oops, and uh, we also got another one. Okay, great. All right, I'm going to clear that. How about OpenStax College? Uh, do folks feel that that would be useful for their faculty and staff at their college? And once again, right now OpenStax only has five, five textbooks. They've got biology, physics, sociology, and anatomy and physiology. So Deb thinks that might be useful. Um, so if you work with faculty or if you teach in those areas, um, those resources might well be worth checking out. All right, how about Merlot.org? How, how do people feel about that site? I, I know we didn't get a chance to visit that today. Um, okay, and Deb also thinks that Merlot would be a useful one. Um, Merlot has 2,200 open textbooks in their listing site, so they have a large set of um, open textbooks. Okay, you looked at okay, Glenn Oaks looked at Sailor as well. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, good. I'm glad to hear that Jess is interested in sailorbooks.org. Um, okay. And there is a lot in Merlot. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right, Rhonda. There's quite a bit in Merlot, and it and it and and yes, Marilee makes a good point that Merlot, um, because it. Um, has so many different options for searching, it can be confusing to the first time user. Librarians um, who are experts at searching uh, are usually are pretty comfortable in Merlot. Um, faculty a little less so. And uh, thank you for sharing that um, some, some of you also went to the sailor.org. Sailor um, so I'm glad we were able to sh <laughs> share that. Um, and now I'm going to try and go through adopt and use uh, quite quickly. Um, there are um, some sort of key components to this, um, which um, many are the same as when you adopt a commercial textbook, um, but there's sort of different pieces um, that you need to be aware of because um, open textbooks will work a little bit differently than commercial textbooks. And so I'm going to go through these steps really quickly. The first one is um, as if you find an open textbook that you want to adopt in your classroom, you need to, of course, um, make, take care of your college's adoption process um, and manage that. In some very small colleges, that's really a very quick process, as I've been told by faculty, where there's one or two uh, members within their department. But if you have a full curriculum committee and you need to talk to your department dean, those are steps that you really want to do early in the process. You also want to make sure your bookstore is aware of that, uh, that choice so that students don't come in and get the impression that there is no textbook at all. Um, librarians can be very helpful in, um, in this process as well. And uh, students are a key piece of this. So student access. Um, will the textbook need to be used in a physical classroom? Um, then you want to make sure that students have access to it either physically in the classroom or through a lab environment. If students are only using this online, um, it may be fine for them simply to have a digital copy. Um, but we know from surveys with students over the last four or five years that still somewhere between 60 and 70 students uh, would like print copies. 60 to 70 percent of students still want print copies. So um, when you're um, looking at an open textbook, choosing a repository that provides a print-on-demand option might be important for your students. And finally, with all different repositories, um, do you want to copy that textbook into your learning management system for so students can access it through there? Or do you want to provide just a link to students so from anywhere, any place, they don't need to be logged in, they can get to an open textbook on the website. So some things for you to think about in terms of who your students are and how you want them to access those materials. Um, with bookstore uh, managers, and, I, and it was great to see that we have one online today, um, confirm with the bookstore that they had the correct open textbook information for students. What has happened in some cases is students will um, access either the 
bookstore um, website or they'll come in and they're told that there's no textbook. Um, and that isn't true, but it's just that there's been a bit of a miscommunication. Sometimes bookstores can provide print on demand um, for students if, um, if they have the facilities for that. Um, in cases where um, a bookstore is a revenue generator for the college, um, you may need to talk with your um, administration, your board of trustees about the savings for students by using open textbooks and does that offset any generation, any revenue generation expectations for the bookstore and are there ways to mitigate that? Um, bookstores still remain the central repository in terms of um, what books are being used, but maybe the model changes over time. And I'd love to have a longer conversation about that. Um, and finally, if you find an open textbook that almost meets your needs but you want to um, change it and add some additional resources, these are some of the issues that you would um, want to make sure you think about a little bit. And today we won't have time to go into, into um, detail on those, but um, remixing OER is, is really a, a, is a topic for another day, but it's, it's well worth um, discussing in the future. Can I ask a question, Una, on that topic right there? Uh, sure, just real quickly. Yeah. Is it possible or is it a requirement that if a faculty member were to download a, um, a textbook, say, and they remix it or they customize it and they put chapter one first or they don't use chapter three, um, is it a requirement that they must um, share that remix, do they have to or do they just use what they want and, and that's, that's what they have to do? It's not a requirement. Um, so if they're going to keep it within their learning management system, you know, right. um, it, it, it's not a requirement that um, you remix it. Um, you, you are required to leave the licensing information within that so that students or other faculty who see it see that original license. Okay. That it was an open textbook. Um, if you're going to publish it uh, um, on the open web, then um, you know, then you have to um, consider what license you you will have to consider the open license. And if it says share alike in the original license, then you will need to be concerned about that. But if you're keeping it within your LMS, just keep the original um, licensing information in the materials that you that you took. Um, and that's okay. sufficient. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, Rhonda, we're a little over time right now, um, and I imagine we'll so we'll have to finish up pretty quickly. Um, so, shall we try and um, let folks uh, use this time offline to discuss adoption concerns? I think so, and I'll ask the group right now um, if they would like to just have another um, session that focuses on adoption concerns and, and a Q&A on that. Okay. Maybe they can type it in the chat room or, or um, you know, put a check mark. Okay. All right. Thanks for that, Rhonda. And I, I know a number of you have to leave. Um, out on the hour and are in the process of doing that. I, I apologize for us uh, um, not getting through this material in an hour. There's, um, there's a lot around finding and adopting that um, requires some thought. Um, okay, another session would be nice. Okay. Yeah, we've got a couple of check marks there and people also mentioning it. So maybe what I can do offline um, with you, Una, is maybe uh, identify a time when we can do just a session on um, adoption concerns. Okay, okay. So that sounds excellent. So I'm going to um, just go to our final slides here. For those of you who, and I know some of you do have to leave. So our step three in this process is the collaboration. Um, even after you've gone through all this announcement um, piece, there's, there's other folks to get involved, campus advocates. Um, um, publishers may be a process, of, you know, both commercial and um, open textbook publishers. So um, it's, 
it's an evolving area and um, getting doing some research as well. Um, from once you deploy the open textbook into your classroom, having a survey with your students at the end of the semester is a very valuable way to gather feedback on how that went. And finally, um, we are trying to make an make open education sustainable. So how can we do that? Um, we can um, promote open practices and policies at the college level or even the um, state level. Recommending open textbooks as a possible solution to the affordability issue and to help faculty to be innovative. Um, librarians can help faculty to find OER. Deans can help faculty to find out OER. Uh, there's way, different ways we can help get students involved. Uh, students are generally very positive about lower costs for their textbooks, um, and they can um, make very convincing cases um, to higher level administrators. And um, openly license your own work. Those of us who are faculty who have taught in the past, you know you're always creating your own materials to bring in. Consider openly licensing those and sharing them out. And then join the open education community as the Michigan Virtual Campus has already done that. And here's a list of uh, different uh, workshops that we offer and ways that we can help. I want to thank you uh, once again for inviting me this morning. We have one more in our webinar series coming up um, on the December 11th. Um, we're going to have a, some folks from the California Community College and Creative Commons talk about some of the work they're doing um, with um, their grant licensing um, to, to increase open policies in California. And that is <laughs> for now at the end. And if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to stay, stick around uh, for another five minutes or so. And I'm, I'm going to turn off the recording now, though, so that uh, our captioner can uh, uh, move on. Thank you, Una.